go. Bryce, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, first uh, first podcast episode, mate. Um, excited? How are you feeling? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I don't, I don't know what to expect exactly. <laughs> that's good. I suppose that's good. I suppose it's, um, yeah, I don't know what to expect either. I think um, what I'm interested in is I'm very much just interested in healing. I'm very interested in integration work. Uh, your lovely partner, your lovely other half, Carmina, who we had on the show last week, um, said that you also have dabbled with breath work. And um, yeah, so tell us about that, mate. When did you come across breath work and how, how did it help you? Um, so me and Carmina started seeing each other uh, about 18 months ago or so. And um, I guess she had sort of like gotten into it uh, not too long before that. And, um, uh, she had like mentioned it a few times and, um, I kind of, I mean, I knew what she was, I knew what she was referring to, but I, I kind of didn't give it much thought beyond that. And then, uh, we were just hanging out at home one night. Uh, I think maybe like two months after we started dating and, uh, I should say at her house. Um, and she was like, do you want to try it? And I, and I was like, sure. You know, um, and again, like I had, I had no real, uh, conception of anything about it other than like, it was a breathing routine, you know, sure. I, didn't, I didn't know any of the, I hesitate to use the word spiritual, but like the spiritual aspect behind it or the healing aspect or any of that stuff. Like I didn't just didn't know. Um, so, uh, so she had me breathe for, I think about 25 or 30 minutes and, uh, you know, I took off and I uh, came back a few minutes later and, uh, I was really blown away by the experience. Um, I used to, uh, uh, be a little bit of a hallucinogenics enthusiast in my, in so my own, you know, so it was, uh, sure. it was surprisingly similar to that, uh, especially to DMT, which I, I thought was interesting. Mm. Um, and then obviously I learned a little bit more about it and found out it, you know, it wasn't similar. It was pretty much the same thing, just a lower kind of lower impact. Mm. Um, so yeah, so I really enjoyed it and, um, and you know, I just kind of chalked it up to a cool experience, you know what I mean? Um, but the, the thing that really like I was taken, uh, by with it was that, um, I've had, you know, I've been diagnosed with like depression and anxiety and stuff like that um, since I was uh, like elementary school, you know, and uh, I used to get like four or five days a week early in the morning, usually on my way to work when I'd be driving, I would get these like brutal, brutal, bad mood swings. And mm. uh, I would like almost have to like pull the car over and start crying, mm. you know, and they would last for like uh, like maybe 30 or 45 seconds and then they'd be gone, you know? And, mm. and, uh, I wasn't taking meds for anything, you know? So it, what, cause you know, my, the immediate question I get when I tell people that was like, you know, what were you on or, you know, what meds have you been taking or whatever? Um, but I hadn't, I hadn't been taking any kind of, um, you know, depression or anxiety medication for, for a while. And I was still getting them. And, uh, and I did breath work that first time and I have not had one since. Whoa. Yeah. No shit. So how long yeah, did you have those mood one. swings for? What's that? How long had you been having those mood swings for? Uh, years, like decades. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have not had a single one since then. Not one. Shit, dude. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. so what do you attribute that to? Like, obviously the, the breath played some part in it, but did something come up or was there like a realization there or, you know, um, uh, that's the majority of the people that I work with have, uh, fairly emotional experiences and, uh, or can have, I should say, um, you know, almost everybody that I've worked with on multiple occasions has had one like very emotional experience and, and I never have. And even that first one, like I said, it, it was, it was very similar to taking hallucinogenics, you know, yeah. I kind of like tripped out and went away for a little bit. And then I came back and, uh, I've had a couple of experiences since then where that have been like very calming and very like, um, 
You know, I feel very connected to like the universe and the people that are in it. Uh, but I've never had one that's been like, you know, like breaking down the walls kind of thing or like any sort of uh, like, you know, what I, what I would imagine to be like working through trauma, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I, so, you know, I've thought, you know, it's been a year and a half and I've, I've, I've wondered frequently like what happened, you know, and I don't have a, I don't have an intelligent answer, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's I'm just like, Hey, it worked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's good enough for me. Um, yeah. So how is it, how is it um, similar to DMT? Cause I've not done DMT before. I've done a couple of other ones. Um, done mushrooms something like mushrooms quite different to breath work but what how is how is dmt um similar uh there's like a there's a um visceral feeling you get like in your torso that's very similar and then also that first trip well i shouldn't say trip my first breath work experience uh and, and a couple since then but that first one in particular with dmt if you if you take a pretty good shot because it doesn't last very long it don't you know like maybe 10 minutes you know yeah uh, for for several minutes you will or i should say i i uh it seemed like i was flying through the sky and like clouds and stuff but instead of blue sky and white clouds like everything was rainbow and yeah. very like a lot of pink like sherbet colors wow. you know like the soft orange and the soft green and the soft yellow like like that and I mean, it's like literally like you're flying through the sky, but it's all, you know, all in technicolor. Um, and I had that, that, those same visuals. Wow. Yeah. It, it just, well, I think what fascinates me about these altered states of consciousness is that, you know, in, in this, I just feel like we only have a minor bandwidth with which to play, you know, when we're in reality, so to speak, and playing around with different things, you know, without getting too, wacky or whatever, even just going, even just traveling, having a different perspective can sometimes be really healing. I think that's what's really exciting about the frontier of psychedelic medicine, breath work, you know, um, is that people are starting to have a think about the benefit of a different perspective. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. 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 I was reading the other day, they've been doing some very interesting work with, uh, psilocybin at, uh, Johns Hopkins. They did, a it was a smoking cessation experiment and they had, I want to say it was like 20,000 or 25,000 people. They gave them, they gave wow. them mushrooms and 85% of them quit smoking that day. <sighs> and haven't had a cigarette for two years since, since, since the, since the experiment occurred, the, the article I was reading was two years later, 85% of the people had not had a cigarette in, in, in that time. It's just insane, hey? Because that's got to be one of the most addictive substances. Nicotine's got to be one of the most addictive things you can get get hooked on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, eighty five percent. That's you know, there's. I don't think any medications have yeah. that kind of success rate. You know, that's insane. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I know, yeah. man. I know. So, when did you start doing DMT? When was your first experience? Uh. uh the end of 2012 oh that's specific <laughs> now what yeah. day and month mate <laughs> yeah uh it was actually man it was like the beginning of december <laughs> you actually know <laughs> yeah yeah it was a big it, it was a it was a big that whole year was pretty gnarly for me and the, and like the end of it uh i came home um and a good friend of mine picked me up from the train station in la and uh, we drove back to Oceanside, which is where I live. And it's, uh, it's like maybe two hours south of like, like downtown Los Angeles. And uh, uh, I remember him telling me like on the way, like, you got to try this stuff. We got, you know, you got to try because I've been doing acid for, uh, you know, 10 or 13 years by that point. So, um, so yeah, I was pretty excited. And that first, <laughs> veteran. One, that first one was gnarly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've always heard that. Uh you take it and it only lasts for 10 minutes or, you know, which is obviously very different to other hallucinogenics, but like if you're on the trip or if you're having that experience, it can feel like a hell of a lot longer. Did you experience that as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, the first time, 
like I said, I was flying through like, you know, the, the rainbow colored sky. And, and the only thing that I could hear or that I, that I knew was real was Zeppelin was playing on my, oh. on my buddy, uh, like boom box. Right. And, uh, I remember just hearing Zeppelin and, and thinking to myself, like, that's the only thing that's real right now. All of this stuff, <laughs> everything else is hallucination, but Zeppelin's real. Yeah. And I remember it, it finished within like a song, you know? So it was, I, I knew it was only a few minutes, but it, se it seemed like it was, you know, two or three hours. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Is, is there a better band that you could trip to apart from Led Zeppelin? I, I don't think so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Zeppelin. so perfect. Yeah, Zeppelin's a fave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what? So what do you do with yourself um, in 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 today's world, mate? Are you um, a breathwork facilitator? Do you do other things? Or yeah, I do facilitate. Um, obviously, with the current situation of the world, um, that's kind of taken a backseat. Um, I haven't I haven't led a circle in um, man. It's a bummer. It's almost six months now. Um, yeah. But yeah, usually I do, I do one group a week on Wednesday nights and I usually have somewhere between like five and 12 dudes show up. And, uh, um, I've been doing that for, uh, man. Uh, cause I went, I went and took a, I mean, they call it certification, but you know, yep. I went and took like a facilitating class, um, at the end of last year. I shouldn't say the end, like in the fall of last year. And I did, I did, I did groups weekly for about six months before, uh, mm. you know, before the whole COVID thing happened. Yeah. It's crazy at the moment, man. I know that lack of social connection and what's it like over there. You you're in San Diego from memory. You're not in LA. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about 35 miles North of San Diego, like downtown San Diego. Oh, nice one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, pandemic <laughs> like over there is it just crazy at the moment uh no i mean it's not crazy you know everybody wears a mask uh yeah. but pretty much everything's open i think like maybe gyms are still closed um uh i'm a general contractor by trade and like you know i go into i go into people's houses all day every day you know and very few people are um you know very concerned most of them are like, Hey, you don't have to wear that in here. You know, like yeah. you don't have a fever, you're not coughing, like you're cool. We're cool. You know? Um, so most people are pretty, um, over it, I'd say, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, gonna, it's funny. Boredom's like really starting to kick in, I think for the world. Yeah. 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 And I think there's the shock value and the, and the sort of like fear, uh, aspect has really, has really run its course and is coming on. Oh, dude, I couldn't agree more. I think people are really over that, um, that narrative, you know, of, um, I was watching Vice last night. It's a movie about um, former Vice President Dick Cheney in the lead up mm. to the Iraq war. That was actually a really good movie, man. Um, but I think one thing I really took from it, because I was only like, well, I was born 93. So how old was I? Eight when 9-11 um, was kicking into gear. And um, as a kid, you just, you know, you got no idea what's going on, but yeah. you consistently hear words like war and terror and mass destruction. And yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not leaning into the side of conspiracy theory. I'm leaning the side of media Muppet or whatever, but it's just interesting how words can be really used, you know, to, to incite fear and all that sort of stuff. And we hear words in this day and age, like, um, COVID normal and pandemic, and maybe they're the appropriate words. Like I'm, I'm not in that area, so I don't know, but it's just interesting how words can have this kind of fear provoking effect on people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it's, it seems like, you know, if it's not one thing, it's another, you know what I mean? I don't know if, if you guys got it there, but in the news here, like right when, uh, you know, like, I don't know, maybe 10 weeks after the the first shutdown or whatever, like people started going really lax and like, you know, every, everybody was just over it. Right. And like, all of a sudden, all over the news were like murder hornets. Yeah. Like this flock of murder hornets. And I was like, are they even trying anymore? Like, <laughs> are they just pulling names out of a hat? Like, uh, you know, like the murder hornets and like, what's next? Like the rape seagulls, like, come on, dude. Like, seriously, like, 
you know, and it's, it's just, <laughs> I mean, whatever, you know, problems, the, we have problems for sure, but it's, it just seems like it's just like, you know, it's just one thing after another. And it's like, like I said, it's like, they're not even trying anymore. Yeah, I, dude, hundred percent. It's, it's such a weird, weird year. It's like the weirdest year I think I've ever been alive, you know, because yeah, to your point, um, you, you got this virus and everyone's like, Oh shit. Okay. This is like the worst. Um, haven't seen this kind of, kind of thing since Spanish flu, you know, and then um, the, the race riots kicking off in America and they're sparking race riots in Australia and in the UK as well, you know, um, for, sorry, not, not riots necessarily, but the protests, yeah. protests for good reasons, you know, um, that shit's insane. But you're just watching all this, standing back, and you're just like, it's all kicking off, like, now. Like, yeah. could, could we try not, like, spread this over, like, a decade? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, let's sprinkle out the shocking uh, yeah. uh, events a little bit here. Yeah. Oh, man, I know. I know. I'd just, like, I'd love to have, like, one news story of just, like, a cat up the tree was saved by a local firefighter, and everyone just had beers and celebrated. Yeah. Everybody lived happily ever after. Ever after. Good night. Exactly. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah, exactly. We don't. We're not chasing the ratings anymore. We just want you to be happy. Yeah. Dude, I know it's it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So, what was that like in LA when when the protests were really kicking off? Um, you know, along with the whole coronavirus thing, were you down in LA? Because because obviously you're a couple of how far away? A couple of hours outside of LA? Or? Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, I'm about like hour and 45 minutes with, okay. with zero traffic whatsoever. Oh, um, right. which never happens, you know? Um, but one of my good buddies is, uh, like this dude I surf with a couple times a week. Um, he, uh, he's in the army, uh, reserve. So he was up there and, um, wow. I mean, he said it was, it was, you know, it was basically like what you saw on TV, you know, people were, setting cars on fire and uh you know breaking into businesses and and setting those on fire and stealing shit and um um you know he was like you know he's like i don't see a whole lot of protesting but i see a lot of rioting so yeah. but i mean granted for you know he's that's what they're there for right they're not there to, to to help like chill out the protests they're there to help chill out the riots so true so I don't know. And LA is huge too. Like downtown, even downtown LA, like, you know, it's blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks. So something could totally be happening, you know, four or five or six blocks that way. And, and, you know, you'd never see it. So that's, that's, yeah. I think that's one of the weird things about the world we live in now. I think like for so many, so many years, people are just like, all right, we'll do the peaceful protest thing and we'll, we'll give this a go. It's like, okay, but then people are still dying. So it's like that you got that social anger building up for so long. And then it sucks on the other side as well, because like, you know, people like your friend are just trying to do their job and keep people from hurting people and ruining businesses that are in no way, shape or form um, related to anything that's going on. People are just trying to make money and cars yeah. that people pay good money for. It's just like, yeah what the fuck is happening? It's so, it's yeah. so weird to, um, dude, I, I just think it's, yeah, like I said, it's just the weirdest time right now. Cause again, like back to, you know, our previous point, boredom is like a real killer. You know, that's one of the first things you learn um, when you're trying to overcome mental health issues. For me, it wasn't anywhere when I was trying to overcome a lot of my pain. It's just like how difficult it was for me to just sit by myself you know, and just not be stimulated all the time, whether it was drugs or food or porn or just TV or anything. I was like yeah. getting real jittery, just sitting alone. And then you put that on, um, you know, these big kind of culture wars happening at the moment. People are like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and I feel like there's a, um, I mean, in the, I don't want to say like the younger generation, right? Cause I'm 33, you know, so I'm not old, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a teenager anymore either. There's just been a, there's been like an upwelling of um, like anger, you know, yeah. about, about the way that everything is. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, you know, even to your point about, about, you know, the constant stimulation, right. It's like, 
it's like it just seems like this there's this overwhelming need to like make the bigger point and to be to be more right and to be more like sure. on top of of the observations of the world going on around you and like more um you know uh more articulate in in your blame for everything that's that's wrong and and you know how how corrupt it is from top to bottom and there's just been uh it seems to me like just this complete like loss of uh like a perspective of gratitude at all you know like for sure for sure there's some bad things happening right now like absolutely and um and you know like you said people getting killed in the street man is 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 unacceptable you know um but at the same time it's like you know across across the history of humanity like we're doing pretty good like totally. we're doing better than anybody's ever done ever you know and and again, we have our problems for sure. And they're bad. Right. But, uh, you know, this, like this tear, tear it all down, you know, yeah. we're going to start from the beginning or, you know, it's just, it's like, it's concerning to me. Dude, it's super concerning to me as well. I was listening to a podcast. Um, and from, from what I've seen, um, there have been people that are going around like, um, ripping down statues and things yeah. of people that had like potentially racist pasts or, or whatever it was. Um, yeah. And for me, that's just like really dumb and ignorant because you actually like, we're such a species of amnesia and we forget things like that. You know, if we actually really want to learn from the past, like why not keep it up there, but like edit the, 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 the placard, make sure, Hey, like it wasn't just all good or she wasn't just all good. She also did this, but because we know that and that's like cemented literally in history, let's learn from it and, and use the past as a tool rather than just trying to like eradicate it and start fresh, which we already can't do. It's impossible. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, and it goes to the point, like not, not to make an insane comparison, you know what I mean? But like the concentration camps, like mm, most of those totally. are still standing, you know, totally. and there's like, there's uh, like, you know, historical and sociological value to that for sure. You know, and, and you tear down, like, again, like you said, like, obviously some of these, some of these statues were erected from what I understand too. Some of them that they've been tearing down were like erected during the civil rights movement in the sixties, like specifically to like shove it in black people's faces, you know, in the South True. and stuff, which I get right. Like, that's not cool. Yeah. Um, but, but again, like you said, you know, like to, to try to, you know, to try to embrace the amnesia is, is, you know, it's, it's like that old saying, right? Like you gotta, you gotta learn for, or learn from history or you're doomed to repeat it, you know? Yeah, man. 100%. Yeah. And see, and see, even then, um, would be a, a brilliant way to once again, learn if these people are like putting up these statues, um, to, to shove it, as you say, keep them up. And then just like have all these signs around it being like, look at the extent to these, you know, fuck sticks. We're trying to like, you know, oppress these people. Look at what they yeah. tried to do. So it's like, if ever, even like the slightest hint of that happens again, we've got the evidence. We're like, actually, you're actually just doing this again, as opposed to being like, well, this has never ever happened before. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a weird time, man. It's, it's, it's a weird time, but I'm optimistic. I just think, I, I just feel like people need a, people need an outlet. You know, that's why when Siobhan came back from her course, um, doing breath work, I've always used the gym. I, I've always just used CrossFit as a way to, um, you know, get that cathartic release. Um, but now the gyms are closed. I've got a bit of a setup in the garage, but, um, you know, having breath work when I feel like really scared or down or resentful, you know, apart from calling dad, <laughs> a bit of breath work actually really helps just screaming into a pillow and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm more of a, uh, I do breath work, but I'm at the skate park a few times a week. Yeah, I, I saw you skate. Yeah, so when did you start doing that? Oh, man. Uh, I got my first skateboard uh, for my fifth birthday, so like 28 oh, wow. years ago. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus, crazy. Yeah, is it, do you actually use it specifically to have time to yourself or... Yeah, Carmina, Carmina is usually the one that's kicking me out of the house to, to send me to the skate park because I'm being a dick or, or like I'm too snappy or whatever. She's like, you need to go to the skate park. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 always it's always been uh like the only thing um that I have that I or that I that I do that I cannot think about other stuff while I'm doing it, you know, yeah. cuz at work or or driving or you know, it doesn't matter where I'm at and um you know, I'm I'm thinking about something else, I'm I'm you know, listening to something else, I'm I'm whatever, you know, and when I'm skating like I cannot I cannot pay attention to anything else. Yeah. You know, because otherwise you're going to slam into the concrete. Oh yeah. Good point. Yeah. There's actually like a safety thing about it. Yeah. 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 Shit. Yeah. That's really interesting. So I want to come back because you, you were talking about um, in the beginning, we were talking about um, DMT. And you said that you had um, some issues with um, some experiences, I should say, because sometimes they can actually be really important with um, depression and anxiety Take us, take us to, to there, mate. Were you, were you um, skateboarding at the time or was there something that happened that brought that kind of stuff on or what was going on? The, you're referring to the anxiety and the depression? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it started, it started young, like elementary school. Um, my teachers would, would like comment to my parents about how I was super intelligent, but I wouldn't do my work. And uh, I had like a very like dark, sarcastic sense of humor, uh, you know, even as a kid. And, um, and uh, in the fourth grade, uh, my parents took me to see, um, it, was a, it was a psychiatrist. I didn't know that. I, it was just this lady. And they were like, we just want you to talk to her. And I was like, cool, whatever, you know? And uh, so we're like, I went and chill, you know, she had like an office with like a, you know, I sat on the couch and like she had some toys or whatever. And, and um, you know, and then a few weeks later, uh, you know, I was on some meds and, um, you know, I was doing better, I guess, you know, um, cause I kept going to see her. And, and uh, I mean, I, I didn't, I remember they told me when I was a kid, like, Oh, we think you're depressed. Oh, we think you're, you're anxious. But, and I like understood what those words meant, but I didn't yeah. like, I had always been me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I didn't have like a frame of reference for what not depressed meant or not, exactly. you know what I mean? This was just who I was, you know? So they called me depressed and anxious and I was like, whatever, you're the doctor. Like, I don't know, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and, uh, you know, so it kind of continued and that was, that was kind of around the time too. Like I started like getting in a little more trouble and just being more like, um, uh, like rebellious, you know what I mean? I was raised in a, I was raised in like a Christian home. You know, my mom was like a Sunday school teacher and, and actually the school, the school that I went to was like a Christian school and, um, you know, like third, fourth grade when I was, was when I was like you know, I think this is bullshit, right? Like, yeah. I'm not really, uh, you know, like whatever, if, you know, Christmas is cool, but I'm, I'm not digging the whole, like, you know, Noah's Ark thing. Like, I don't fucking <laughs> think so. You know, like two of every animal on one boat, like there's a billion insects. Like I'm seven. It's not, floating. Yeah. you know what I mean? And, and, totally. and so I just, I started like kind of pushing back against everything at about that age, you know? And, um, and so, you know, I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was, you know, sort of my parents attempt to like wrangle me sort of back into, you know, into like control or whatever, you know, but, um, you know, and, and the meds would help for a little while. And then, and then after a while I would, you know, I'd start, you know, I don't know if I became, um, you know, developed tolerance or what, but, you know, so always the answer was more pills or, or something new or or whatever. And, um, and yeah, I mean, you know, all the way, all the way up until, um, so I was medicated from the age of like eight until I was, uh, 20. Uh, I quit on March 6th of 2017 was the last time I took like a, 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 a mood stabilizer, like mind altering, um, you know, antidepressant, anti-anxiety, one of those kinds. So Did did you, did you ever feel like, um, you were becoming dependent on them or, you know? Uh, no, like they would, um, 
no is the answer to your question like they would they would kind of like make it easier to like deal with school and stuff for a little while um but then then you know like it would go back or it would be like it would just be like everything was like bland you know Mm -hmm. like there was no real you know because i've always been like very you know full speed or doing nothing full speed or doing nothing right and so when i take these pills it was more like you know like oh i'm going to school yeah going home you know like whatever like it's like the dmt you know. rainbow cloud <laughs> yeah 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 and uh so yeah i mean i i ended up like you know once i was in my like teens you know what i mean i started uh i started like selling them and stuff you know because a yeah. lot of the pills that they were giving me were you know narcotics of one yeah. form or another so uh you know i figured you know i, I don't really like them I don't really take them. Like I could make up what, what turned out to be a bunch of money. Uh, yeah. So I did that for a while and <laughs> not that I'm recommending that to anybody or anything like that, but totally. Unless you go to a festival. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shit, man. It's just such an early age to be giving like a child, you know, um, these kind of narcotics, you know, you look at um, what's going on with the opioid crisis in America. And I'm sure that's not only America. I'm sure that's going into all different areas, but it's like such a slippery road. You know, you have pain, um, you're on Oxy, you know, and then next thing you know, because it's so much more expensive than heroin just becomes like, there's obviously I'm not saying that's everyone and that goes down, but I'm just interested in like, you know, the, the big pharmaceutical companies and, and like their, their, their willingness to push medication on, um, on perhaps a lot of people that might just have more benefit from some kind of holistic approach, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's like they say, there's no, there's no profit in a cure. True. And, Very true. And, uh, you know, I actually, um, I don't know if Carmina, brought it up when you did her podcast, but you know, we're both sober and I've been sober for like five and a half years now. And I was asked uh, maybe a year and a half ago to speak at this. They were doing a, it was a documentary about the whole opiate crisis, like how it started with big pharma and, and the sort of like distribution and sales tactics that they were using on doctors uh, prior to, prior to the doctors really knowing what was going to happen, you know, or, or seeing any of the results that, that ended up occurring. And, um, I mean, it was brutal. The things that, mm. that these people were telling doctors, you know, it was, it, it was just, it was insane, you know? And like, I'm sure the documentary was skewed to make its point. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, but I mean, there was a lot of like interviews with people who were like, oh yeah, they told us like it wasn't going to be addictive. Like it shouldn't be a problem, you know? Yeah. And yeah. it's like, dude, I've seen people, you know, lose their minds coming off those pills. Totally. Totally. It's, um, I'm pretty sure they had, um, sales, salesmen and women go out to, um, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's not, um, weird or anything, or maybe that's the norm. In fact, I'm probably sure it is normal. If it's a company, you got to have a sales department, you yeah. know, but pushing these, I think, you know, pushing these agendas, like Oxy is really good, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and look, like, it's true, it, it will mask the pain, but there's always like a deeper thing going on. And very quick, very quickly, we can become addicted to the coping strategy rather than have to deal with the pain. You know, that's why I'm so obsessed, man, with root cause therapies and root cause, because there's so much more power to the individual. You're like, holy fuck, like, that was a massive thing that happened to me. Um, I'm using trauma as an example, but that was a massive thing that happened to me. And I have the courage and the bravery and the willingness to confront it, knowing that it could screw me up forever, but I can't, I came out of it on the other side. Now I'm not reliant on a crutch that I have to pay $400,000 for a day. You know, it is so much more power to that. And I, I feel like what's so exciting is that we're now starting to move and it could be in a bubble. I hope I'm not in a bubble with this, but we're now starting to move into a world where people are starting to ask deeper questions because there's so much more information out there and go, wow, like if that person had that happen to them, like I'm so similar and you know, I'm enough of these pills, enough of these, these addictions, enough like time to, you know, take my life back. Yeah. And I think that, I think that also goes back to your point about the the bandwidth that we operate on is so narrow, you know what I mean? And we found answers within that bandwidth, um, like oxys, like, you know, uh, my dad 
has had like seven or eight surgeries on his spinal cord mm -hmm. and they gave him oxys after right and uh this last time they had given him more than they had ever given him before and i was like hey dude like take it easy you know yeah. what i mean and when it's time to stop it's gonna suck it's gonna be really bad you know and he's like well i don't get it you know like i've been taking these pills and like you know it's i mean it's it feels good but i don't understand like what the big you know why everybody like likes them so much and i was like dad it's not taking them it's quitting that people can't do mm. like it's not the high it's it's they're not trying to get high they're trying to get you know undeathly sick yes you know what i mean and uh and he was like oh oh okay <laughs> you know i was like and um, you got it <laughs> yeah but like you said i think i think as a as a as a whole our sort of like willingness to reach outside our bandwidth, you know, cause science is broad and fantastic and incredible. Right. But it's still very narrow, you know, and, and it, you know, science could be buried underneath the avalanche of things that we don't know. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. You got to start listening to your self trusting, trusting yourself more, you know, that, I think that's like the first thing it's like, wow, I feel really weird about what this, this person's telling me, you know, um, I'm going to try this, you know, and just, just see where it takes it. Use your body as an experiment, you know? Um, so you've been sober for five years from alcohol and drugs and both. Or? Yeah. Everything. What was that? Yeah, was I that think, a, yeah, go for it. I was going to say, I, like I said, I was, I was taking, uh, so, so this is a whole nother story, but I was on, <laughs> I was on mood stabilizer meds as a, a condition of my parole for the first sure. couple of years that I was sober. Um, but when that was over, I quit taking those as well. And and now I don't take like no alcohol, no weed, no, no drugs, nothing, not even prescribed narcotics. What was that like? Um, was it like a cold Turkey thing for you? Or was it like a, a, a program come in? It was, um, we got into this hectic conversation about um, the genesis of um the 12 step program with like these influences from like Carl Jung and all that sort of stuff. So I've still got to read a couple of books that you recommended me, but yeah. What was that like for you, dude? Uh, well, you know, I started partying and stuff when I was like in my early teens and, uh, that's what everybody here does. You know what I mean? Like I grew up surfing and skating and like you, you know, you turn like 12, 13, 14, people start smoking weed and, you know, sneaking beers on the weekends and whatever. And, um, and, uh, like by the time I was 18, like I knew, I knew that like I was going to have a hard time, like balancing my desire to get fucked up with like being an adult, you know? And, um, and, uh, you know, so I battled it for most of my twenties and, um, you know, ended up getting strung out and, and, you know, like I just don't have an off button, just like I talked about earlier. You know what I mean? Like it's either, it's either 150% or it's nothing, you know? And, you know, as a, when that manifests itself for me, when it comes to using drugs and drinking, it's, you know, it's 150% until I fall out, you know? Yeah. And then that's my zero. And then I wake up again and I do the same thing. And, um, so yeah, so I, I was, uh, you know, I knew that it was, at some point I was going to have to probably just stop doing everything. Cause I didn't, I didn't possess the ability to like balance or moderate, you know, as it, as it comes, as it turns out, I don't possess that ability for most things. It's not, it wasn't right. just drugs and alcohol. It was, it's, it's most of the things in my life. I, I can't, I have struggle moderating. Um, but yeah. And then, so, uh, so I woke up, uh, on my 28th birthday and, and just was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Wow. And, and that was, uh, May 11th of 2015. So it's been, it's been almost five and a half years. Wow. How, what was that? Yeah. Okay. Cause I'm, I'm always interested in that. I used to be a CrossFit coach actually. And I've always been interested in that, um, that ability for people to make the switch, you know, that, that never again thing, or, or it doesn't have to be never again, essentially. Like you can have pitfalls along the way, but it's like, I'm now on the path, you know? So did you, was it, it sounds like to me, you had pushed yourself to this extreme level of, I can't do that again or else, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be ever 
get get to live life, you know, and then it, it was cold turkey from there ish. But um, do you do you have some like moments leading up to that switch that you can look back now and go, oh, that was actually like a pretty significant thing, and this is probably why I've I made the switch at that time. Um, there had been there had been a bunch of things that had been like sort of eating at me over the, over the couple of years prior to that. Um, you know, I had like nothing to show for myself, you know, I, you know, I'd spent a bunch of time locked up, you know, at that time I was living in like this halfway house in, uh, in this really sketchy part of town. And, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm the oldest of three boys and, you know, both of my younger brothers are like college graduates. One's got a wife and, and two kids and one on the way, the other one's like, trying to start a business up in Northern California, like, you know, and I just felt, um, it was just like brutal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just, I was just like disgusted with myself. Um, but a big part of it was like, I had been in and out of the whole like AA and a thing for a couple of years at that point. And like in those meetings, you know, you frequently see people who are like, you know, 50 or 60 years old and they're telling stories about how they've been you know they've basically been fucking around with aa for the last 25 years wow. you know and now they're now they have you know grandkids that they've never seen because they're homeless and they don't have you know like they're all of their belongings fit on the back of a mountain bike and it was like mm. like the the real clarity like moment of clarity was like okay i can either be one of these people wow. sitting in a meeting in 20 years going i've been clean for the last 20 years or I can be one of these dudes talking about how I fucked around with getting sober for the last two decades. And this wow. is what I have to show for my life. Mm. And it was like, when I, when I had that like thought, I was like, Oh, okay, done. You know, like it was just, a, it was a no brainer at that point. And I mean, that, that's one of the things about human motivation, right? Is that, you know, we are motivated by pleasure and how good life could be, but we're also motivated by, motivated by pain and how bad life could be, you know? And I think when you set like a really authentic uh, framework for yourself like that, um, because you feel stuck or because you feel like you're doing the same thing or you're, you're going on a loop, people often neglect that pain side. You know, they neglect that. All right. If I keep doing this, where am I going to end up in three, five, 10 years? You know, if I, if I continue to binge, um, with food, you know, or drugs or whatever. Um, how bad is life going to get for me? And, and fear is such a, it's, it's a stronger um, motivational force. Um, they've measured this with rats. So there's, there's a neuroscience to it. You know, it's a, it's a much stronger motivational force, but it's a hell of a lot harder for us to confront because it is anxiety provoking by definition. So I, I just find that really interesting that, by you showing going to these meetings, it's like, wow, it was, a, it's not so much of, I want to get clean or I want to be able to control this um, because of, I've got all these goals, you know, but it's like, I just don't want to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, fear was an excellent short-term motivator. You know yeah. what I mean? And it, it got me, it got me like in the door, so, so to speak, you know, um, but thankfully, like I've done the, the work necessary to like yeah. get my fear behind me and get my goals in front of me, you know? So I have not only something that's like the fear is almost pushing me, you know, and the goals are like pulling me as opposed to like, you know, just running from the fear. Right. Yes. So, I mean, cause, you know, once I started, do, you know, started, I'm, it sounds like you talked with Carmina a little bit about, about the whole genesis of AA thing, you know, <laughs> and those, in my opinion, those steps are important. Uh, not, not just for like addicts and alcoholics, but like for anybody who's trying yeah, to, like, I agree. you know, battle, battle themselves, right. The deep, like, you know, the demon that mm. they have in them. And, and like you said, whether it's drugs or food or sex or shopping or whatever, it's like, you know, I've, since I've gotten sober, like I I'll swear to anybody that asks, like everybody has this thing. I promise yeah. it just might not manifest itself in you the way that it does in me, mm, but you know, mm. it's there, it's there for sure. Totally. Dude. I couldn't, I could not agree more with that. That that's actually, it's not so much a pet peeve because I don't want to be that mean, but it's like a, I've always got to put my hand up and, and 
talk to people when they say I have an addictive personality because it's addiction is rooted in our biology. You know, I've, I've studied addiction um, extensively because I, I never identified myself as an addict, but I also was struggling with food and porn and external validation was big for me. You know, these, these potentially um, more or less intangible addictions than your classics, you know, of, of drugs and alcohol and all that sort of stuff. And I was really interested in, you know, cause I would say that as well. I'd be like, yeah, I've just got an addictive personality. I, I'm, I'm either zero or a hundred. Um, but if you have a look at the biology and what happens in animals, what happens in rams, you know, and um, we, we have what we are wired to survive. And when we see a, a very calorically dense, big fat cake on the table, we're going to ham it down unless we're really, really conscious or when we have some kind of um, program or purpose or will. That's one of the things I love about um, the, the 12 step um, program, you know, that, that spiritual element to it, you know, people don't, um, I think it, you know, you don't have to go as outdated and call it God or whatever it is, but it can be another person that you're doing this for. So it's, it's more than just you. There's a, there's a, a, a social element to it as well. Dude, I totally agree with you. I think, they are fundamentally just important life lessons, really. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's excellent. It's a good way to learn about yourself. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, uh, he's on. <laughs> uh oh. Did it go away? No, no, I've still got you. I've still got you. Okay. You cool. can answer it if you need. No, no, no. It's, um, it's actually one of my sponsees. <laughs> Oh, but um, synchronicity. Yeah, right. You heard me talking <laughs> about it. Exactly. Uh, but what you were saying about like the biology of it, um, you know, I was listening to a podcast uh, just a few days ago, and this guy was talking about, um, you know, the dopaminergic and serotonergic systems in our brains mm. lobsters have, mm. and. Uh, you know, we, the animal that would become humans split from the animal that would become lobsters somewhere between 350 and 600 million years ago. Yeah. And that's what I tell the guys I work with. It's like, you know, this, this is the evolution that you're up against here. You know, you've totally. got 350 million years at least of evolution that you're fighting against. So, you know, I hope you weren't, uh, I hope you weren't anticipating some sort of cakewalk because this is going to be it's rough. It's so true. Dude, were you listening to this guy by any chance? Jordan Peterson. Yeah, I do listen to him frequently. He's good. This, this, this book here is, I've got his other one, um, 12 Rules. And 12 Rules, there's a whole, I think the first chapter is about those systems in lobsters in the first part. But I also recommend his other one. It's a It's a big read, but... What he talks about in terms of the um, pain and pleasure systems in, in, in the brain and, and how we're wired literally to survive. And then slowly but surely, we've developed this um, greater capacity to analyze ourselves and perceive our own experience and all that sort of stuff. Um, lots of people think it actually came from psychedelics, like Terence McKenna, the yeah, yeah. ethnobiologist, you know? Exactly, exactly. Um, so that's really interesting in and of itself. But um, I just think, I think the more we understand about where we came from and our own evolution, it's like a big, to your point, dude, it's like a big sigh of relief. It's like, oh, wow. Because I think one of the worst things that mental health and addiction does is that it makes you feel really alone and isolated and ashamed of yourself. You know, like you feel like, why does everyone else seem to be able to control these things and I can't control? I'm such a piece of shit, you know? And when we understand how we're wired, you know, it's like, Oh shit. Okay. I've still got my work ahead of me, but at least I feel a little bit more included now. Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, that was, I struggled really, really like mightily with the whole 12 step thing because of the God, uh, aspect of it, you know, you know, or, or higher power or spiritual, yeah. whatever, you know, there's so many ways that, that people try to, you know, they try to like distill it down or whatever. Um, but the, the, 
sort of biological understanding that I came upon um, was really the thing that like saved me, you know, yeah. because I, yeah. I didn't, it just seemed insane to me. I would go to these meetings, you know, and, and uh, I would, I would tell people like, I'm, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic, you know, and this is like a medical, like doctors tell me this is a medical problem. Right. And, uh, you know, people in meetings were like, oh, sounds like someone needs a higher power. And I was like, did you hear what I just said? Like medical, medical issue here, you know? And they were like, yeah, get on your knees and pray, you know? And I'm like, not helping, dude, not helping at all. Like, exactly. you know, and um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was brutal. You know what I mean? I was stuck for like several years. Like I didn't wow. know what to do. And I really didn't think, I really didn't think that any 12 step program was worth anything because of that, you know? And fortunately I, I met some people and I kind of, there was a, a few like very, very like fateful or, uh, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it. There was a few things that happened to me and there were some things that I learned over like a, mm, like, a, maybe yeah. like a 12 or 18 month period that sort of like gave me, um, gave me a unique window into being able to, to conjure an understanding of like what, what people call God, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or that thing, um, you know, and may, maybe, maybe that window was opened by that thing or whatever, you know, but, but I mean, to this day, man, like the most arrogant, the most arrogant thing I hear people say in meetings is a higher power of my understanding. Yeah. So what do you mean by that? Like, as in it, 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 for them, it works, but it doesn't matter if no one else understands that or what do you mean? No, I just find it. I find it arrogant that people, that people believe that they understand the universe so fully as to, as to state in front of other people that they understand God, mm. you know, like, like, dude, you don't, not you, but like the average person, like Including you don't even know how your, yeah, you know, you don't even know how your cell phone works. And you're Perfect. telling me like, you know, you're in a, in, you know, I, I have a higher power of my understanding. It's just one of those things like, mm. uh, I sort of sit on the like edges of 12 step programs because a lot of my opinions like run really against it. And like, I'm really not a fan of a lot of the guys that founded AA and, yeah. um, you know, like, I'm grateful for it. And I don't think that the events unfolded accidentally, you know, but, um, there's just a, there's a ton of stuff like in the book and in the way that people talk about being sober and the way that people talk about, you know, a spiritual experience and the 12 steps and all that stuff that is like highly misrepresentative in my opinion, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I feel like for a lot of people, it comes off as, you know, like you better hope for some, magic dead right voodoo experience otherwise you're going to die a drunk or you know or strung out or whatever mm. uh, you know it's just a i don't know i probably should let people be and just mind my own business you know but like i said earlier like i can't not think about other things you know so it's like everything that everybody says i'm just like analyzing it down to the like last comma you know like you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> that's probably why we get along like I, I'm exactly like that to almost to the point where like, I can't let things go. And I'm, I'm not consciously thinking, all right, I'm going to put my friendship or my relationship with this person to the side to find out the truth. I don't think that I'm just like, but what do you mean when you say God, what do you mean? And they're like, Oh dude, just shut the fuck up. I'm like, I can't shut the fuck up. I have to know. What are you saying? You know, but dude, I, I, it's so true. What you're saying, like, I gave my life to God. It, it, it's almost, it's cliche when people say stuff like that. It's just like, Oh, okay. He's found God. And it's like, it's, but if we have a look at it from a secular perspective, you know, it's like, okay, so you found a purpose, you found a reason greater than yourself. Um, this makes perfect sense. Like, Oh yeah. But you know, it's, it's not that it, it's God. And it's just like, Oh, you've just, you've just found, you've just indoctrinated yourself to another belief system. Like, I'm happy that you're not doing drugs and alcohol anymore, but like you've just fallen into another ceiling of intellectual discourse almost, you know, 
we could be wrong. We are probably going to cop, cop shit for this podcast episode. I've got heaps of shit from other podcast episodes before, but I don't know. I'm looking forward to the comments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you're not getting a bunch of comments, you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> true. It's true. Oh man. But I, I really, I do agree with that. And I think um, without having read the AA literature for people, I th- I th- I've interviewed a few um, people who identify themselves with addicts and people that have had alcohol and drug issues in the past. And that's the number one roadblock that they have all seemed to have had, whether that's just me, um, you know, attracting people that have that kind of similar idea. Um, They love everything that's in the program, except when it comes to this, you know, give yourself to a higher power. It just seems really outdated, you know? Yeah, and it's funny because if you read the AA literature, it states several times in in several of the books, like you don't, we, we we're we're not demanding that you believe anything, you know. Mm. But when you when you talk to people, that you wouldn't think that that was what it said, mm. you know. But like like I said, it you know that was that was one of my sort of odd occurrences that I had early on in sobriety was. Um, you know, there's like the big book, which is like AA's Bible. Right. And that was written, um, by one of the founders when he had like three years sober, he'd been sober for like three years Mm. and, um, and is, is, you know, slightly contradictory to say the least. Right. Cause anybody that's, Mm. that was a, you know, raging alcoholic for most of their life, it takes longer than three years to get all your marbles back in a row. Right. I can tell you from personal experience. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And, and so that there, there was a, there was a second book written, well, there's been, there's a few, but there was another one that was written uh, 10 years into his sobriety with a doctor. It's much shorter. It's much more concise. And in it, it says, it says explicitly, like, first of all, Alcoholics Anonymous does not demand that you believe anything. You know, Mm. you never hear people say that in meetings. You always hear, you know, you know, screaming about how, how, you know, you have to find a God or, or, or a higher power or whatever it is, you know? And it's like, it's like, whatever, you know, if that was your, if that was your path or your course, or, you know, you, you found something that you call whatever you call and, and it, and it helped you get through the things that you needed help getting through. That's great. Mm. You know, but you shouldn't scare people away because it's culty sounding, you know what I mean? Super Nobody wants sounding. to show up at your cult and, you know, listen to people yell about God, you know, or yell yeah. at them about God, you know, that's a bummer. It doesn't matter who you are. You know? <laughs> Definitely, man. Uh, I, and, and to the point where it's, you can almost, you, you peer into the cult and you, and you, you can see, okay, these people are, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to even believe that they know what they're talking about. Like we said before, like, so true. You know, I don't even know. I don't know how these earphones work. I don't know how do you make a jumper. I don't know how you make a sweater. I don't know what what happens. I, I, I did like a, a knitting class when I was like 10 and I fucking sucked at it. Yeah. I, I didn't know how to make a sweater. <laughs> so like, but there are these people and look, you know, I'm retarded. So there could be someone out there that really understands God. Best of luck to them, you know. Um, I think that's why I like Jordan Peterson though, because he breaks down the psychology of religion and spirituality and you know to my best understanding <clears throat> finding a higher power is like a, a a path a different path like an important path like a purpose you know and i think that kind of stuff is starting to um you know permeate the culture a bit social media like we all need kind of a purpose and like a a, a reason to do the things we do and that that stuff can be incredibly motivating you know yeah, you know, he talks frequently about um, Sisyphus, right? Mm. The, the Greek the mythology. Bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, which I f- I think is important. Like the idea that like really, like you hear people say all the time, it's it's not the destination, it's the journey. You know what I mean? But that's that's really like a biological imperative. You know, it's like it's absolutely necessary for us people like, you know, I, 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 I'm almost certain I've heard him refer to people several times as pack animals. Like yeah. we need, we need a load and a burden to carry. Right. Mm. And, um, and that's, um, that's something too that I like about him is that, you know, he emphasizes that it's not, it's not the understanding or the, or the, 
belief. It's the journey in or towards a better belief or, or, you know, or whatever it is that you're, you know, journeying for. Dude. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. I love that. And you know, the dopamine and the serotonin working in unison with mother and other, you know, the, the, the reward, let's fucking get there. And then the pleasure and the satiation and then the reward, let's keep going. You know, we can't stop. And we now live in a time where we don't need to survive. Um, but those biological drivers are still in us. So it's like, we need to find a reason to keep getting up every morning to, so to speak, get the food and mate and have fun and all these things that are so necessary to optimal, uh, mental health, you know? And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a funny time. People have, one of the reasons I love doing a podcast is because you meet all these people that have all these different ways of essentially getting the same thing. You know, right now we're just talking about feelings. People just want to feel good or feel like they're doing something. And I, I interviewed a guy who um, his full-time job is hosting a game of Thrones podcast. Yeah. It's sick. It's like 80 grand a year. I don't know how much he was making, but like just to talk about a TV show, I'm like, dude, yeah. you are getting your biological drives. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy, man. People make money doing, <laughs> doing whatever now it's this the whole like podcast social media avalanche that's occurred in the last you know i mean 10 years or so it's just it's insane and it's it's opened up such a um such a flow of information you know like it's been it's been so cool i mean there's i'm sure there's not i'm sure there is like negative aspects to it too but it's like um you know, it's just, there's, there's so many things that I know and that I've learned and even people that I've ended up meeting, like even as a result of this COVID thing, you know, mm-hmm. doing, doing uh, a lot of social things that I used to do in person, I do, you know, via Zoom like this, right? Yeah. And I get to meet people like you that I probably wouldn't have met otherwise, sure. um, you know, and, uh, you know, like I said earlier about, about you know, kind of the state of things like concerning me so much, but, but at the same time, like, because of this, because of experiences just like this one right here, I've had the opportunity to meet so many people that I'm like, like, maybe we're going to be okay. Like, I think, yeah. it'll be all, you know, like maybe it's just, maybe it's just like the, the craziest 5% that's always on TV, you know, that like, they're the ones that are getting the ratings, you know, and, and hopefully the majority of us are just sitting at home going, do you look at these assholes again? <laughs> again, it's been six months. Like, let it go. You know, like so true. You know, everybody's just sitting back, having their coffee, trying to, you know, trying to like, you know, just shake it off and, and laugh it off. And so, oh man, I couldn't agree more. Like, like, hopefully, yeah, like you said, ninety five percent or more of the population just like don't have the energy to um, blow the world up, incinerate it, tear it down, you know, or just yeah, ruin it. And then we all just kind of want to. I feel like this, that most people just want to get along and can't be fucked, <laughs> you know? And that's good. Human beings like, you know, all right, so we have an issue with boredom. So we're inherently lazy. Fine. Embrace it, you know, do your bit, you know, but enjoy the ride. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, and the, the inherent laziness, you know, you get what you deserve right True. like n- not like not from like a uh like i don't i really don't like the word karma but like that you know what i mean like yeah, yeah. you get out what you put in right and and uh you know and if you want to be lazy and and skate on on as you know the least amount possible then that's what you'll get back you know what i mean and and that's good enough for some people right some people are some people are you know more accepting of the problems they're familiar with than the solutions that they're not, you know, and, and it just yeah. comes down to like a familiarity thing, I think. Yeah. That's, that's really good. I really like that. Yeah. And as long as you're real with yourself, you know, um, taking full ownership of who you are and, and why you're doing what you're doing, you know, if you want to, if, if you're like a super, super conscious drug addict who frots getting high and, and taking pills, it's like, I totally get that I'm doing this right now. Um, I'm using my own money. I'm doing it myself. It's like, all right, like 
do your best, you know, but it's your decision, you know? Um, I think people just have to be real with themselves. I, I know that because I, I struggled with that for such a long time, but it, it's changed my life massively to be like, oh no, actually I did lie heaps then, you know, sorry, you know, um, I didn't brush the dogs. That's a, that's a reoccurring uh, thing going on at the moment. <laughs> i got to brush the dogs shortly after this podcast, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good problem to have. Yeah, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. Very uh, fairly low on the list of impactful problems. <laughs> Brush the dogs. I know, mate. Big day today. <laughs> uh well, Bryce, it's been awesome, mate. Um, what's coming up for you? Obviously, we've got the virus going on at the moment, but um looking to hopefully get breathwork facilitation coming up again and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm kind of in a period of transition right now. I just uh I just became a licensed general contractor. So I'm sort of like pushing to get that thing off the ground. Um, I really have wanted, I've been having people reach out frequently, especially over the last few weeks to do uh, breath work via Zoom, mm. uh, which Carmina does all the time. Um, but I, I just didn't have, um, nobody was interested for the first few months, right? Because I think everybody was just under the, you know, Oh, we'll, we'll be back here in a few weeks or whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, so I'm going to start pushing forward on, on the whole, you know, breath work over zoom thing. Um, and I'm probably going to start doing something a little, uh, you know, my, my circles in the past have always been, um, sort of open-ended and uh like joyful you know and i think i'm gonna take a little bit of a heavier tack you know and sort of turn into the storm kind of thing mm. um and and uh so i'll be <clears throat> ideally what i want to do is create some playlists uh with some particular songs that i have in mind that have a um like a little bit lower and darker sort of feel and nice. uh and talk about um you know the shadow right mm, mm. and uh so we'll see how that goes you know we'll see how that goes and then uh and then you know just stay in the water stay on the skateboard and try not to get hurt and make a little money while i'm at it yeah look, look after yourself for sure dude um where can people find you are you on instagram you're on instagram no you're on instagram yeah yeah my instagram is great white bright <laughs> yes which is uh underscores in between great and white and Bryce. And, uh, I'm on Facebook at Bryce Turvey and, uh, that's all the social media I do. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, this has been great, man. I really enjoyed this. I think this is some of my favorite podcasts where we just, uh, riff, we never met each other before and, um, you know, we take some things away. So yeah, I really appreciate you to do this, man. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I, like I said, I really didn't know what to expect, and this was this was awesome. I appreciate it. Your opportunity to do your own podcast now, mate. Man, if I had the time to be doing <laughs> podcasts, I would. I am yeah. I'm up to my eyeballs in responsibilities. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I know I look like you know I look like uh, uh, a little bit of a unscrupulous character, man. But I got you know I couple of kids that were, you know, we're trying to get through school. And like I said, trying to start a business and, you know, Carmina's got a yeah. business to run and, and I'm starting, I'm start I'm going to tear out our kitchen here in, uh, on the 19th. So I got that going mm. and, um, no risk, no rest for the wicked baby. Very true. Very true. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. Bye. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.